And really tonight, I want to talk about a personal Pentecost. You know, books on the Holy Spirit and messages on the Holy Spirit are very popular. We like to read about what happened to some people when they were filled with God's Spirit. But it's like Duncan Campbell, the revivalist from the Hebrides, said, the first time he came to North America after the great revival in the Hebrides in the late 1940s and early 1950s, he said the churches were packed to the doors to hear what had happened. He came back several years later, many times in the same churches, and the crowds were abysmally small. And he said, it suddenly dawned on me that people wanted to hear about revival, but they did not want to experience it. And many times we want to hear about Pentecost, and we don't want to experience it. We want to hear about the Holy Spirit, but we don't want to experience his power in our life because of the changes he might ask of us, and the changes he might make. We might also call this the sixth Pentecost. On the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2, I don't know if you've ever thought of this, it was a Jewish Pentecost. They were Jews from every nation under heaven. The preachers were Jews. It was strictly a Jewish Pentecost. Pentecost. And as we know, 3,000 Jews were converted in a single day. That's amazing. Jewish people are very hard to reach for Jesus Christ and always have been. In Zechariah 7, it says they made their hearts as an adamant stone. There's a stone called an adamantine. The word diamond is a corruption, I understand, of the word adamant. They made their hearts as hard as a diamond, lest they should hear the law and the words which the Lord of hosts had sent in the Spirit by the former prophets. Therefore came a great wrath from the Lord of hosts. Therefore it's come to pass that as he called and they would not hear, God said, they will call and I will not hear, but I scattered them with a whirlwind among all the nations whom they knew not. And anyone working among Jewish people today will tell you the same thing. It's very difficult. They're very much opposed. We owe a great deal to them. They gave us the Bible and they gave us Christ. but they're very difficult to reach. And sometimes we feel, well, it's hardly worthwhile expending energy and money on Jewish evangelism because the results are so meager. And really I think that what we need is another Jewish Pentecost. Couldn't God do it again? He did it then. Is God any different, less powerful? I think not. Back in those days, the Jews were hard-hearted too. Didn't Jesus call them a generation of vipers? All people say he was talking about the Pharisees and the Sadducees. But what did he say about Capernaum, a city, and Chorazin, and Bethsaida? He said they were worse than Sodom and Gomorrah. He said it would be more tolerable in the day of judgment for Sodom and Gomorrah than for these cities. Yet it was people like that that were converted, thousands of them, on the day of Pentecost. A Jewish Pentecost in Acts chapter 2. In Acts chapter 8 there was a Samaritan Pentecost. Philip was the preacher The people believed in Christ and were baptized, but did not receive the Holy Spirit until the apostles came down from Jerusalem and uh, laid hands on them. It was a Samaritan thing. 
there are Samaritans. And the Samaritans represent false religion. Ever read 2 Kings chapter 17? The origin of the Samaritans. Israel and the northern kingdom had been carried away captive by the Assyrians. And then they took men from certain cities in their country and sent them down to live in the cities of Israel and Samaria. But lions began to decimate them, so they sent an urgent message back to Assyria. They said, we don't know the manner of the God of the land. They were thinking in terms of some tribal deity. And the lions are killing us. So they got a backslidden Israeli priest and sent him down And it says he taught them the manner of the God of the land. And then what happened? It says they feared the Lord and served their own gods. Now how in the world can you do that? I mean, how can you fear God and serve your own gods? So it says in that chapter, after saying this, that they feared the Lord and served their own gods, it says they fear not the Lord. You see... Their fear toward me, God said in Isaiah, was taught by the precepts of man. Intellectually, they believed in the same kind of God as Israel did. But it was not in their hearts. They did not fear the Lord. These were the Samaritans. And to the Samaritans, Jesus said in John's Gospel, chapter 4, You worship, you know not what. In vain they do worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. They didn't know what they were worshiping. Yet there was a great revival among these people. And hundreds of them were converted. Even a woman that had six husbands. You have had five husbands, and he whom you now have is not your husband, Jesus said. And she was converted. It was a Samaritan Pentecost. You know, we Christians sometimes, when we look at Mormons or Jehovah's Witnesses, or Buddhists, or Hindus, or Mohammedans, we say, they're very hard, you can't do anything with them. And we kind of write them off. Jehovah's Witness comes to your door, what do you do? You, close, you say, no thanks, and close the door in, your face, in their face. Why don't you say something about the Lord? Oh, sometimes we're afraid. Well, we say, I never hear of a Jehovah's Witness being converted. Maybe that's because they don't try. If the Samaritans who were worshipping, they knew not what, could be converted. Large numbers of them. Can a Jehovah's Witness be saved? I think so. A Mormon, yes. Certainly. I remember preaching the gospel in a logging camp one time where the whole camp was Jehovah's Witnesses. It was a hornet's nest. And they were out to get me. And I enjoy something like that. You know. And here's what we did. The night before, I was in a Mennonite camp. They're mostly all Christians. They had a beautiful quartet there. And I said, listen, you guys, tomorrow night I'm going to try and have a meeting in the Joe Witness camp. Would you guys come over and sing for me? Sure, they said. No music. Fine. So they came over. Now, I didn't tell the JWs. I asked if I could use the cookhouse. No, they said they're painting the floor, which they weren't. I said, what about the other cookhouse? Well, they said they're washing the floor. I said, what about the bunkhouse? And they said finally, well, uh, yeah, yeah, you can have a meeting in the bunkhouse if you let us ask questions afterwards. Great, sure, why not? (laughs) So they came, and the place was packed to the doors, and in walked these four Mennonite Christians, and it really threw the JWs. They didn't know what in the world this was, you know. And I told these fellows, I said, you know, JWs don't believe in heaven, so sing that song, How Beautiful Heaven Must Be. They don't believe in being saved, so sing the song, I'll be saved tonight. And that's what they did. You know, dear people, I preached, trusting in the power of God. There was a fellow on a top a double bunk, you know, sitting right, I could have patted him on the head. He was just taking everything in, you know. And uh, at the end, I said, now we promised we'd have some questions. Do you have any questions? And believe it or not, there wasn't a single solitary question. I gave them an op four or five times. There wasn't a sound. We closed the meeting. The next morning I was walking away from the mill. I was walking from camp to camp with a pack. Kurt will know about that. 
in the earlier days, and the mill broke down, and so I went over to talk to the, the lumber pilers, the green chain fellows, and here was this guy who was on this bunk, you know. Man, he said, that was great last night. I said, what was great? He said, I found out last night you could know you were saved. Oh, I said, really? What happened? I got saved, he said. We don't have any aggressive evangelism among people like this so they don't get saved. A Samaritan Pentecost. We need that today to reach these people. I was down in South America and in uh, Temuco, southern Chile, where 40% of the people are born again, a city the size of Saskatoon. And they told me there wasn't a, a house in the place that didn't have at least one Bible. And so I was going around getting pictures, some movies of various churches, you know. And uh, finally the fellow taking me around said, would you like to get a picture of a Mormon church? I said, yeah. That'd be a contrast. So we got down there. We pulled up in front of the Mormon church. By the time I got out of the car and had the camera ready, there was a Mormon there starting to preach. I admired that. And uh, I shared the gospel with him. I remember telling him, I said, young man, I respect you, but you're on the road to eternal hell. You must be saved through Jesus Christ or you'll never see heaven. You'll never have eternal life. And he backed away. He stood there with his mouth open. A Samaritan Pentecost. We need that. Then there was a Gentile Pentecost in Acts chapter 10. They were all Gentiles. And you read about the Gentiles, you know, in Genesis chapter 1. It gives you a graphic, almost a scary picture of the Gentile world. When they knew God, they glorified Him not as God. Neither were thankful, it says, but they became vain in their imaginations and their foolish heart was darkened. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools and changed the glory of the incorruptible God into an image made like the corruptible man and to birds and four-footed beasts and creeping things wherefore God also gave them over to their own heart's lust. And he talks about that from there on, being filled with all unrighteousness, envy, murder, debate, deceit, all the rest of it, who knowing the judgment of God that they who commit such things are worthy of death, not only do the same, but have pleasure in them that do them. Being alienated from the life of God through the ignorance that's in them because of the hardness of their hearts. And you know what happened? Among Gentiles, these kind of Gentiles, a whole congregation was converted after a five minute sermon. And when I say five minutes, I'm exaggerating. It was a Gentile Pentecost. But in all three of these cases, there was prayer. Ten days of prayer before Pentecost among the Jews. The apostles' prayers before the Spirit was poured out on the Samaritans. And Peter prayed. And Cornelius, unconverted, he prayed. Because the 11th chapter makes it very clear that these people in the house of Cornelius were not converted people. They were not born again. They did not know Christ. They were told to send for Peter who will tell you words whereby it says you and your house will be saved. So they were not saved people. Isn't that amazing? Short sermon. When Peter got to those words, to him, that is to Christ, give all the prophets witness that through his name whosoever believes in him shall receive remission of sins. That's as far as he got. He said later on, as I began to speak, can the Spirit do a thing like that? Yes, He can. In the Hebrides revival, here were 80 young people at a dance. The band wasn't playing for a few moments, so the guys are on one side, the girls on another. They're drinking. Suddenly one of the men says, he's holding a bottle of whiskey, and he said, men... I think we should drink all we can tonight because I have this strange feeling that after tonight we won't be drinking liquor at all. 
And a few moments later, his bottle fell out of his hand and hit the floor. And he fell on his knees and began to weep. In five minutes, all 80 of those young people were on their faces crying to God. And they were all saved. And there wasn't even a preacher in the place. And people say, how in the world can that be? The explanation is quite simple. And I say this to the shame of North American Christianity. In the Hebrides, prior to the revival, in every home in those islands, they had Bible reading and prayer twice a day. Converted homes and unconverted homes alike. Bible reading and prayer, a family together twice a day. So all those young people had heard the basic truths of the gospel and God didn't need a preacher. It seems when we think about a revival, we think though only of a Gentile sort of Pentecost. But that's not all there is. In Acts 4, we have what we might call a local church Pentecost. That gets a little nearer to where we live. I don't think there's a church in the world, an evangelical church in the world, that God could not revive. Corey taught that everywhere he went. He said, I don't believe there's a church in the world that cannot and will not experience revival if it will meet God's conditions. It is true, of course, that God is sovereign. But it's also true that the Spirit was poured out on all flesh, Jews, Gentiles, Samaritans, 2,000 years ago. He has never been withdrawn We are living in the age of the Holy Spirit. Therefore, we are living in the age of revival. I think Tory was right. Although beyond all of this has to be God we know. A church, Pentecost. The apostles were threatened and told not to speak in the name of Jesus. So they called a prayer meeting. Not a business meeting. They didn't write letters to the editor of the newspaper. And they didn't complain to the Human Rights Commission. They had a prayer meeting. And when they had prayed, the place was shaken where they were assembled together. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit, not just the preachers, the entire congregation. And what happened there in Acts chapter 4 is sometimes being called an extension of Pentecost. Indeed, in my opinion, all revivals are an extension of Pentecost. But this was a church revival. And I know often, I know in talking with pastors, as as I so frequently do, many pastors have sort of given up. They hope that one time they've given up on it. They don't really feel that their particular church can ever experience a revival. Back in the early 1800s, there were numerous powerful revivals sweeping the United States. British Christians got concerned about it and uh, contacted American Christians and said, can you tell us something about it? So they sent a man named Clarence Larkin over to England and he traveled to many places, England, Scotland, Ireland, telling about the marvelous work of God in the States. However, he could only be in a few places because he had to get back to his own charge in the United States. So then he wrote a book called A History of American Revivals of Religion, which I picked up in a second-hand bookstore in Winnipeg for 25 cents probably 40 years ago, published in 1832. And there's a couple of statements in the book that I want to share with you. One was this. He said, We were never in our churches satisfied with what he called insulated conversions. We would use the word isolated. Insulated conversions, ones, twos, threes, a family, a couple of families. That was fine, he said. But that was not revival. So he said, we fasted and we prayed and we preached and we believed until, as he said, the Holy Spirit came and took the work out of our hands and then made the entire community aware of God. Then hundreds would be converted. And then he said this, 
This kind of revival never ever came to a church that did not believe it would come. And it never failed to come to any church that believed that it would come. That was a challenge to me. I also believe that this kind of revival can come to any church that will pay the price, will hang in there until God answers. And sometimes it's difficult. I was in Salem, Oregon some months ago. Wally Croglets used to have a church in Surrey, B.C., and I had meetings with him there, and he went to this church down in Salem, and there were practically no young people in the church, mostly older couples. church was declining. People were leaving. He said, I've preached my heart out for two years, and nothing's happening. He didn't know what to do. Well, I started on Sunday Gave invitations. Nobody responded. I think it was Tuesday. A girl of 18 accepted Christ. And I think the most we had respond in any meeting was two. So what, we, what do we do? We had a day of fasting and prayer. The preacher, his wife, and myself. And that night, over half the church responded. He wrote me several times since then, There hasn't been a week, he said, that souls have not been converted. He said the church is just in a totally different situation spiritually. He's just rejoicing. But looking at it those first few days, it sure didn't look very good. But I think we have to learn to keep our eyes fixed on our God. A Gentile Pentecost, as I said, a sermon less than five minutes long, and a whole congregation of unconverted people swept in the kingdom of God, everybody say, by the power of God. But we're talking about a church Pentecost in Acts chapter 4. And I want to encourage pastors and lay people, we're all, I trust, connected with some local church somewhere, Revivals needed. Seek the face of God. Call on Him. Believe Him. Every time you go to a service in your church, pray before you go. Spend five minutes, ten minutes, half an hour, an hour in prayer, calling on God for an outpouring of the Spirit. You'd be surprised what might happen. And then, of course, we have to believe. Remember, it's the age of the Spirit of God. He's here. He's doing it in different parts of the world today. Then there was a missionary Pentecost in Acts chapter 19. Paul found twelve men who were converts of John the Baptist, would have not even heard about the Holy Spirit. So he gave them further light, told them they must believe on Jesus, laid hands on them, and twelve men were filled with the Holy Spirit. Dick Shipley said a little bit about that this afternoon. What happened as a result of twelve men experiencing the filling of God's Holy Spirit. It says that all of Asia heard the word of the Lord Jesus, both Jews and Greeks. So it says, mightily grew the word of God and, I like this, prevailed. That was a missionary Pentecost. Because there have been revivals that have not moved outside a local church. I've sometimes heard it said, and I don't agree with it, that if a revival comes to a church and it doesn't issue an evangelism, it's not a true revival at all. Now, historically, that's not true. Jonathan Edwards tells, he said, it was probably the most powerful church revival he ever witnessed. And it did not move into the unconverted. 
He offered no explanation for this. He just recorded it as a fact. So that's possible. But I think the ideal, certainly closer to the New Testament ideal, would be that thousands, yes, and millions might hear the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's a tremendous challenge to me, dear people, that there are 800 million Muslims in the world, and in most Muslim countries, there is no such thing as free preaching of the gospel. In Saudi Arabia, South Yemen, North Yemen, it is illegal for a Muslim to forsake his faith. It is against the law. I know in the Philippines I met a fine Saudi Arabian, six foot three, fine looking fellow. He'd met a Filipino girl who was a Christian, and he said, as he gave me his testimony, he said, I figured I could twist her head around, make a Muslim out of her in no time. And she twisted his head around, he became a Christian. And he was baptized while we were there. Now he said, when my family finds out what happened to me, that I became a Christian, they will hire an assassin, and he'll tra- track me down no matter where I go in the world, and they'll kill me. Because I brought this honor on the family name by turning to Christianity from the Muslim faith. Dear people, we have to start praying and believing God that He'll open up these countries. He can do it. He said, I've set before you an open door. Let's ask God to open doors in all of these countries. That's why this book, Operation World, every Christian should have it. Read it. Get a prayer burden. Not just for your own church, but for the world. We need church revivals. And we can have them if we'll pay the price which can be high. Saturday afternoon, I guess it is, I'll be speaking on the place of prayer in preparation for revival. So I will not develop that at all tonight. Then this brings it down to personal Pentecost. Because, you know, even in a genuine church revival, there seemingly are always some who do not respond. It was true in our church in Saskatoon. Several men, particularly, who never responded. One of them, since then, about five years ago, through Gordon Bailey's ministry, committed his life completely to God. He'd been a Christian for years. I haven't heard his testimony. I know him well. But Gordon said he's with me in meetings. He sings in meetings. He gives his testimony. He said he just weeps his heart out when he tells these people, whatever you do, don't miss it. He said, I sat through seven weeks of a powerful revival and I hardened my heart. I turned off my ears and I wasted all these years. Don't ever make the mistake that I made. Personal Pentecost Galatians 4 says, Because you were sons, God has sent forth the Spirit of His Son into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father. To the Christians at Corinth, Paul said, What? Don't you know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit, which is in you, which you have of God, and you are not your own, for you are bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. Digress for a moment. Every Pentecost, whether Jew, Samaritan, Gentile, church, missionary, or personal, must come through our Lord Jesus Christ. In John chapters 14 to 16, there are four separate places where we're told that when the Spirit comes, it will come from Christ. He said, I will send him unto you. Whom the Father will send, he said, in my name. Four times. This is why in Acts chapter 2, the Apostle Peter said, 
after the resurrection and on the day of Pentecost, this Jesus has God raised up whereof we all are witnesses. Therefore, being by the right hand of God exalted and having received of the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, He, Jesus Christ, He has shed forth this which you now see and hear. Pentecost, I say, was a Jesus Christ happening. He did it. He received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit. You know, remember in John 20 when Jesus breathed on the disciples and said, Receive you the Holy Ghost? I don't believe they received the Holy Spirit then. I'll tell you why. Because in the same context, he said, As my Father has sent me, even so send I you. But they were not sent till after Pentecost. When Jesus Christ breathed on them that day, I think this was Pentecost in embryo form. For in the day of Pentecost, the risen Christ breathed on them. That's why there was this rushing mighty wind that came from heaven. He did in fact what He had done that day. Paul said, Philippians chapter 1, I know that this shall turn to my salvation through your prayer and the supply of the Spirit of Jesus Christ. He, therefore, that ministers the Spirit unto you and works miracles among you through your prayer and the supply of the Spirit of Jesus Christ. So, if you're thinking of revival, you have to think of the Lord Jesus Christ It pains me sometimes when I hear people saying, Revival changed me. Revival did not change you. Jesus changed you. I think one of the reasons why some people don't make much progress, even after experiencing a personal revival, is because they keep thinking in these terms. Revival did this for our church. Or revival did that for the church. But the Spirit came to glorify Christ. A personal Pentecost. You know, Dwight L. Moody sought the face of God for months on end, seeking the fullness of the Holy Spirit, and two elderly Methodist ladies, they had told him he didn't have the power of God, and he was quite piqued, you know, because he had the largest congregation Sunday evenings in the whole of Chicago. But what they said got through to him, and he began seeking the fullness of God, and one day... I think maybe eight or nine months later, walking down the street in Chicago, he was mightily filled with the Spirit of God. He said, I never preached any different truths. I preached exactly the same kind of sermons I'd preached before. But where one and two was converted, now hundreds and sometimes thousands were converted. Now, Finney, on the other hand, never sought the face of God to be filled with the Spirit at all. As a matter of fact, Finney said he did not even know that there was such a thing. He sought God out in the forest. He found Christ as his Savior. He went back into his law office. He sat down beside the fireplace and he received a tremendous, mighty baptism of the Spirit of God. He never sought it. God did it. And the following day, every person he talked to was converted. And when the population of the United States, probably at the beginning of his ministry, was 16 million... And when he died, maybe 25 million, a half a million people found Christ through his labors. J.B. Earle, he tells what happened in his case. He couldn't understand why God wasn't blessing him because he said, he told God, he said, God, you know I often cry when I preach. I've got a tender heart. And God said, no, you don't. No, you don't, he said. That's just water off an iceberg. So he sought the face of God one night. And all he says is at 2.30 in the morning, after pleading with God for hours, he said, I receive the fullness of Christ's love. That's what he said. Now Spurgeon's experience was totally different. He was young, had accepted Christ, heard about baptism, 
And he discovered that the meaning of baptism was death to self and resurrection to a new life and walk with God. So he made up his mind he would not accept baptism until he could honestly say, I'm dead to myself and alive to my God. So he took his Bible, went off in the woods, read his Bible by the hour, prayed and prayed and prayed and called on God. And after several weeks of thus seeking God's face, he said, I felt I could now say I was dead to myself and alive to my God. And he applied for baptism. He was baptized in a river dividing two counties. He says prior to that day, he frequently doubted his salvation and he was constantly afraid and fearful. He had no power to share Christ with anybody. But he said, when I went down under the waters, he said something happened to both my fears and my doubts. And when I came up out of the waters, he said, the river washed them all away and they went down at the ocean and he said, the fishes must have swallowed them because they never felt them again. Sam Chadwick. He was reading in the book of uh, Judges, Gideon. He was concerned because he knew his life was not filled with God's Spirit. And he came to this verse that says, And the Spirit came upon Gideon. And he noted the marginal reading says, The Spirit clothed Gideon. And it spoke powerfully to his heart. So he took a pencil and he scratched out the word Gideon and he wrote in the word Sam Chadwick. And he simply, dear people, claimed it by faith. And God made it real. You know, in Second Thessalonians chapter 1, Paul, he prayed, well, there were three things, but one was this, that God would fulfill the work of faith with power. He didn't say the act of faith. He said the work of faith. You have to keep believing, keep on believing, keep on trusting, no matter what happens. And there comes a day when God fulfills the work of faith with power. Charles Trumbull was sitting in a meeting and the preacher was preaching on the filling of the Spirit and gave an invitation for those who wanted to experience this to come forward and he did. Prayed a while at the front. Nobody counseled with him. Went back to his seat. A friend leaned forward and said, Why did you go forward? He said, Because I wanted to be filled with God's Spirit. His friend said, Did you receive? He said, Yes, I did. He said, How do you feel? He said, I never asked for feeling. I asked for the Holy Spirit's fullness. But it was from that night that Charles Trumbull was mightily used of God. And for a personal testimony, before the revival in 1971, my church would let me go out here and there sometimes to conduct meetings in other churches. And if I saw a couple of people saved and half a dozen people start tithing and a few people get baptized and join the church, I was quite happy. But the first crusade I conducted after God touched my life, there were probably a thousand people responded. Many were saved. Many went into full-time Christian work. It was a totally, totally different situation. I mention these other men because there's always a danger that we'll try and copy someone else. The experiences these men had were all different. There was one common feature or fact, and it was this. Blessed are they that hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. You may have to wait a long time. I read a rather pathetic story, and yet it blessed me, about a certain preacher who sought the fullness of God for years. Nothing ever happened. And he was in his study one day, seeking the face of God. And heaven was absolutely silent. And he felt so discouraged. And he walked out of his office and didn't notice his dog was sleeping across the entrance. And he tripped over his dog and fell flat on his face on the floor. What next can happen, you know? And while he was laying on the floor, he said he experienced such a filling of the Holy Spirit as he never dreamt was even possible. I guess God had to get him down that low. I don't know. And after all, a dog, the Bible says you're not to bring a price of a dog or the hire of a whore into the house of God. God has to humble us. 
in closing, I want to say this. I don't believe in any Pentecostal experience that does not produce a loving heart. God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. Your love, the Bible says, in the Spirit. Another phrase, Romans 15.30, the love of the Spirit. What did Moody say? Moody said, I felt I could take the whole world into my heart after he was filled. What did Finney say? Finney said, I felt as if I were being fanned with gigantic wings of love. That's what he said. I don't believe and a Pentecostal experience that does not produce joy and peace. The kingdom of God is not, right, is not meat and drink. It's righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. For even these things serves Christ is acceptable to God and approved of men. Or Romans fifteen thirteen, The God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing that you may abound in hope through the power of the Holy Spirit. I don't believe in any Pentecostal experience that doesn't make a person an honest man. Now Paul said in Romans 13, it's high time to awake out of sleep, for now is our salvation nearer than when we believe. The night is far spent, the day is at hand. Let us therefore cast off the works of darkness and let us put on the armor of light. Let us walk honestly as in the day. Pray for us, for we trust we have a good conscience in all things willing to live honestly. I don't see how there can be a genuine Pentecostal experience that doesn't produce a liberal heart. Finney said he never knew God to bless a stingy church. And I'm sure if that's true of a church, it's true of the individuals who make up a church. I read in 2 Corinthians chapter 8, it says the the abundance of their joy and their deep poverty abounded unto the riches of their liberality. They never had much. The Bible speaks about joy in the Holy Spirit in 1 Thessalonians chapter 1. They never had much, these people. But oh, they gave. Their hearts were filled with joy. And they gave gladly. Billy Sunday said, a lot of Christians, they give a nickel and then sing, God be with you till we meet again. You know, my wife and I had a funny experience one time. There was a fellow in our house and he was struggling spiritually. And, and uh, we were talking to my wife and I and this question was asked, Are you tithing? Oh, yes. Yep, he said, I tithe all the time. And as soon as he said it, the light, the floor lamp right next to him clicked off. Now, he didn't know it was on a timer. You know, so. And he sat there. I mean, the minute he said this, the light went off. So he turned and he looked at the light and he said, Okay, okay. Yeah, sometimes. Then he sat there and he looked back at the light and he said, okay, five bucks a month. He that sows sparingly shall reap also sparingly. He that sows bountifully shall reap also bountifully. Every man according as he purposes in his heart, so let him give. Not grudgingly or of necessity, for the Lord loves a cheerful giver. Oh, he loves a cheerful giver. And if I am a stingy giver, I'm not filled with God's Spirit. I don't care what kind of an experience you've had. I don't believe in any kind of filling of the Spirit experience that doesn't result in humility. You know what it says in the context, be filled with the Spirit, Ephesians 5.18, in the context following? It says, submitting yourselves one to another in the fear of God. A Spirit-filled Christian will submit himself to other people. He won't want to be the boss. And pick up on that in 1 Peter chapter 5. It says, Likewise, you younger, submit yourselves unto the elder. Yes, all of you be subject one to another and be clothed with humility. For God resists the proud and gives grace to the humble. I'm sure many of us are not filled with the Spirit because of some of these problems. We're not humble. We have no intention of, you know, sharing our wealth. What did Paul say, Ephesians 4? Let him that stole steal no more, but rather let him labor, working with his hands a thing which is good, that he may have to give to him that needs. 
And the church in North America has got to get around to this and to these things. I don't believe in a filling of the Spirit experience that doesn't result in soul winning, a concern for the loss. You know, in some evangelical circles, and I know this from experience, the Christians in some churches, in some groups, they're giving themselves wholeheartedly to good works. They're helping needy people in Africa and all around the world, and there's nothing wrong with that. I'm all for it. But that's all they do. They never share Christ. They say, well, they, they see Him in me. Supposing the Apostle Peter, on the day of Pentecost, just got up there, never said a word, smiled sweetly, gave somebody a hamburger or something, and then exuded the quiet confidence in God. How many would have been converted? I mean, nobody would have found Christ. Somebody has to tell them. Who can tell them better than you? Or me? If it's genuine, it has to be biblical. This is what I'm really saying. He that believes on me, as the Scripture said, out of his innermost being shall flow rivers of living water. But this he spoke of the Spirit, which they that believe in him should receive, for the Holy Spirit was not yet given, because that Jesus Christ was not yet glorified. You're born again. God's Holy Spirit lives within you. The people that had the Spirit, indeed Paul said they were sealed with the Spirit and grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby you were sealed unto the day of redemption. And the day of redemption is the day of the return of the Lord Jesus Christ. To these people Paul wrote and said, now be filled with the Spirit. They were sealed by the Spirit. The Spirit lived within them. Their body was His temple, but they were not filled. In Galatians 5, Paul said, More correctly, the Holy Spirit said through Paul, If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. Most Christians are living in the Spirit. Of course, if I'm born again, that's automatic. Romans 8 says, You're not in the flesh, but in the Spirit. If so, be that the Spirit of God dwell in you. Now, if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he's none of his. So if I'm born again, I'm no longer living in the flesh. I'm now living in the Spirit. So the Word of God says that we live in the Spirit. Let's also walk in the Spirit. Now that has to do with a totally different dimension. Surrendering to God. Allowing the Holy Spirit to lead me. If you live after the flesh, you shall die. If you through the Spirit to put to death the deeds of the body, you shall live. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. Walk in the Spirit and you'll not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Galatians 5, 16. The flesh lusts against the Spirit and the Spirit against the flesh and these are contrary the one to the other so that you cannot do the things that you would. World revival. Dick talked about that today. Thank God for the burden he has. There's a verse in the Psalms that says, When the Lord shall build up Zion, He shall appear in His glory. He'll appear in His glory at a time when He's building up Zion. And people mistakenly think it'll be at a time when God is building up the nation of Israel. The Zionist movement, now I'm quoting from leaders in Israel, and they say the Zionist movement is not in any sense even religious. It is totally political. The New Testament, Zion, Hebrews 12, 22, you are come unto Mount Zion, he says to Christians, and unto the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to an innumerable company of angels, to the general assembly and church of the firstborn who were written in heaven, and to God the judge of all, and to the spirits of just men made perfect, and to Jesus the mediator of the new covenant, and to the blood of sprinkling that speaks better things than that of Abel. The New Testament sign is a church. And when God builds up Zion, He'll appear in His glory. So Christ will come at a time of worldwide church revival. That's what I believe. So, we should not be thinking really of a Jewish Pentecost, or even a Gentile Pentecost, or a Samaritan Pentecost. 
Let's be thinking of a worldwide Pentecost, touching all segments of society. I don't know how significant what's happening this Glasnost think in Russia is. I must admit I'm somewhat suspicious. I don't know. But right now you can ship Bibles by the thousands into Russia and the same thing is happening in other communist countries. Now it may be a ploy. We don't know. We have to watch as well as pray. But now we can send Bibles and let's do it. They say they'll no longer jam radio broadcasts coming into Russia. I see in Yugoslavia, they just said Marxism doesn't work. We've tried it. It's phony. It doesn't work. And there's, there's new winds blowing in communist countries today. I know some of us have prayed for this for years, that they'd open up to the gospel. Maybe this is happening. What about the Muslim world and the Buddhist world and the Hindus? The Mission Fest in Winnipeg, George Werber, Operation Mobilization, among other things, they had a man there who is from Burma. There are 350,000 Christians in Burma. There's been a real work of God there for years. But there are several warring factions, and they've been mining areas and fields and so on against each other. And what they've been doing in some areas is taking Christians and making them sweep the minefields. Make them walk through the field. In one area, 130 Christians so died walking through minefields. Another area, 40 Christians die. As Dick said, it may be bloody. We may have to pay an awful price because the forces of hell will be against us when this worldwide revival comes. Pray for it. But be prepared to pay the price, whatever it is. The blood of the martyrs is the seed of the church in Africa today. It amen was bad enough. A man who has contact with Uganda told me very recently it's worse now than it was when Idi Amin was there. That is with Christians being martyred. Thousands of them. Maybe that'll have to go along with it. I don't know. If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more shall your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to them that ask Him? And Peter said in Acts 5, the Holy Spirit whom God has given to them that obey Him. And J. Edwin Orr, who wrote all those books on revival and researched revival for 35 years and experienced revival in his own ministry, the last thing he said publicly before he died a year or so ago was this. Preached a message on revival, end of the message, stood there a few moments in contemplation and then uttered these words, O Holy Ghost, revival comes from Thee. That was it. That's a line from the song he wrote. Search me, O God. Dear people, revival comes not through platform personalities. It comes from the Spirit of God who came to glorify Christ It'll have to be a movement that gives Jesus Christ all the glory. If we try to make it a denominational thing, it's going to sputter and go out. We've got to get beyond that somehow and get a picture of God's world and God's program, which is that everybody should hear. Look upon Zion, the city of our solemnities, Thine eyes shall see Jerusalem, a quiet habitation that shall not be taken down. Not one of the stakes thereof shall ever be removed. Not shall any of the cords thereof be broken. But there the glorious Lord shall be unto us a place of broad rivers and streams. Wherein shall go no galley with oars, neither shall gallant ship pass thereby. Dear people, all my springs are in thee, David said. May we say the same. God bless you.